When you walk in the projects, you can't help but feel frustrated. You see so much raw, untapped potential here. You see it in the sparkle of the little kids' eyes. But you doubt if that energy will ever be put to its best use. Instead, there are the banal, soul-sapping realities of ghetto life. Drugs, violence, disease, and despair. I know. I came from here. My name is Walter Williams, and I'm an economist. Why does this poverty persist? The easiest thing to do is to choose a scapegoat. Capitalism, racism, vandalism, communism. Instead, some economists, including me, are trying to apply the scientific tools of economic analysis to the problems of poverty. The results of our work often go against the traditional arguments. The civil rights marches of the 1960s woke up America's consciousness and helped end racist practices. That was good and necessary. But in the 1980s, racism doesn't go very far in explaining why American blacks are behind other groups. Racism exists. It exists everywhere. African blacks discriminate against Arabs. Japanese discriminate against Koreans. Malaysians against Chinese. Ad infinitum. Yet, discrimination hasn't prevented some of these groups from succeeding. Rather than racism, it is the economic rules of the game that are handicapping blacks today. These rules are the many federal, state, and local laws that regulate economic activity. A lot of these laws discriminate against people who happen to be outsiders or latecomers to the economy, or those who have few economic resources. Because of their tragic history in the United States, blacks fall into that class of people more than most other groups. I see government not as the solution to our problems anymore, but as the problem. Government rules and regulations have rigged the economy against poor people. These rules, many of which were enacted in the 1930s, have cut poor blacks out of the kind of upward mobility that let other ethnic groups, Jews, Italians, Irish, and Polish, pull themselves out of poverty. By the time blacks became urbanized and received the franchise through the 1964 Civil Rights Act, they had almost been locked out of the private economy. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, birthplace of the Declaration of Independence, Hiding in the shadows of Philadelphia's skyline is North Philadelphia, the black ghetto. At the heart of North Philadelphia sits a sprawling, aging conglomeration of cheap apartment buildings known as the Richard Allen Housing Project. It was built in 1941 to house the poor. I know the Richard Allen Project well. When I was a kid, we lived there. My father deserted us when I was three. Like other tenants at the Richard Allen Project, my mother was on and off welfare. She never liked taking it, so she did day's work as a domestic. She raised my sister and me all by herself. She was a proud woman. When I was a kid growing up in the project, I didn't have much time for games. I worked since I was 10 years old. I shined shoes, I delivered packages, I washed dishes at Horn and Hardard. But the kids today are different. They can't find work, so they play basketball and maybe dream of making the Philadelphia 76ers. Back in 1948, before dramatic increases in the minimum wage law, black youth unemployment was 9.4%. Today, it stays at 50% or more. That isn't because employers have become more racist. We can't even blame today's black youth unemployment on recession. No, the culprit here is the minimum wage law. The minimum wage law is telling our young people that if they can't produce $3.35 an hour of goods or services, then they are not worthy of a job at all. This is so because the minimum wage law requires every employer to pay a worker at least $3.35 an hour, no matter how unskilled that worker may be. However, the businessman has to look at more than that $3.35 an hour. He also has to pay Social Security, unemployment compensation, and fringes such as insurance. So the actual cost to the employer is around $4 an hour, 
even for the lowest skilled worker. A lot of 16-year-olds just don't have the capacity to produce that amount of goods and services an hour. Kids are kids. They're inexperienced, they're immature, they haven't formed good work habits. Maybe a teenager can only produce $2 an hour worth of goods and services. It is a losing economic proposition for an employer to pay somebody $3.35 an hour when that person can only produce $2 an hour worth of goods and services. There was a time when even small neighborhood movie theaters had three or more ushers to show moviegoers to their seats. Now go to the biggest downtown movie theaters and there are few ushers. The reason why ushers are not in theaters is not because Americans of today like to stumble to their seats in the dark. No, the reason is that the minimum wage law has eliminated that sort of low-skilled job. Fast food restaurants like McDonald's and Burger King install high-tech electronic gear to do the jobs that teenagers once did. Automatic dishwashers have taken over from teenage dishwashers in restaurant kitchens. It is worse than that, though. Not only has the minimum wage law eliminated a lot of low-skilled jobs, it has also caused a lot of other low-skilled jobs not ever to be created in the first place. Nowadays, kids reach the age of 25 without ever having had a work experience. The only profession open to some of them is crime. It's damn unfortunate. If these bad effects of the minimum wage law only meant that some kids were being deprived of spending change, maybe we could just chalk it up to foolish government intervention and forget it. But not so fast. Early work experience gives kids a lot more than spending money. It teaches kids how to find a job in the first place. It teaches them that they can't come to work with a blaring radio. It teaches them that they have to come in on Friday, even if they got paid on Thursday. It teaches them that they can't spit in the foreman's face and still keep their job. Working gives a sense of pride, too. It is the kind of pride that comes from being at least a little bit financially independent. A kid knows he's an adult when he brings home that first paycheck. The minimum wage law puts black teenagers in a double bind. First, the public schools deliver a fraudulent education to ghetto teenagers. Many graduate from high schools not knowing how to read or write or do math at even a sixth grade level. If they're going to learn anything that will make them valuable employees in the future, they're obviously not going to learn it in the public school system. At the same time, the minimum wage law denies these kids the alternative of going out and learning job skills in the marketplace. They're cut out from learning job skills at school and cut out from learning job skills at work. As for protecting the worker, the minimum wage law only protects those skilled enough to produce at least $3.35 an hour of goods. People who aren't skilled enough to produce that value of goods are thrown out of work. They earn zero an hour.